This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. My guest today is Jungian analyst, author, and art therapist, Nora Swan Foster. She holds a master's degree in expressive arts therapy from Lesley College in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and a diploma in analytical psychology from the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts. She is also a licensed professional counselor and has been certified by the American Art Therapy Association and the National Association for the Advancement of Psychoanalysis. Additionally, she has received training in EMDR resourcing, NLP, focusing, psychodrama and somatic processing, and has completed level two of brain spotting. For eight years, Nora taught graduate art therapy courses at Naropa University and participated in their curriculum development and admissions. Presently an adjunct faculty member, she teaches a graduate requirement, Jungian psychology, transpersonal foundations, and central concepts. She is a founding member of the Boulder Association of Jungian Analysts' Jungian Studies Seminar, which became an affiliate of the Interregional Society in 2014. There, she teaches analytical psychology and is their local seminar coordinator. Since 2011, she has served on the membership committee and the final exams and review committee for Interregional and is a member of the editorial board for the Journal of Analytical Psychology. Her chapter, Jungian Art Therapy, included in Dr. Judith Rubin's 2016 book, Approaches to Art Therapy, Theory and Technique, became the impetus for her own book, Jungian Art Therapy, A Guide to Dreams, Images, and Analytical Psychology, published by Routledge earlier this year. She will be presenting material from the book at next year's IAAP Congress in Vienna, and it is the subject of our talk today. This interview is being recorded on Monday, July 23rd, 2018, through the magic of Skype. Hi, Nora. Hi, Laura. Today we're here to talk about your book that was published, I believe, in January. Yes. It is called Jungian Art Therapy, A Guide to Dreams, Images, and Analytical Psychology. You are an art therapist. Yeah, that's correct. You know, my background is in expressive arts therapy, but we had to focus in one area. So I came into the expressive arts with so many different interests, and um, uh, I had to choose one, and I chose art. So uh, the art therapy has really been uh, a segue into Jung and this the idea of the image. So, um, so now, were you a licensed professional counselor before you became an art therapist? No, actually. Uh, my background is in creative writing and English literature. And, you know, I just really was trying to figure out what am I going to do with my life and happened to um, uh, receive a mimeograph sheet. Do you remember mimeographs oh, in those yes. days? I, sure I could do. barely read it. Yes, I could barely read it. And um, there was an expressive therapy program at Leslie in Boston. And I thought, wow, this would be a way for me to integrate all of my interests. So that's where I started with, um, uh, I started my Jungian analysis. We had to be in therapy. And so, um, I worked with a Jungian analyst and also, uh, at Leslie, I was, you know, studying various theories. Uh, Jung was unfortunately not a primary focus at that time. So, I was kind of living in two different worlds. You know, personally, I was doing, uh, working with my dreams and my art with my analyst. And then in my academic work, I was looking and my internships, it was much more Freudian oriented. Mm, okay. So, uh, yeah, so I was living sort of that original split that happened right. um, and trying to figure out how do I bridge these? Um, and as I say in my book, there's, you know, Jung is not always seen as a a clinical, you know, has clinical material. So people fall into thinking more from a Freudian perspective. So at the same time, um, I was, you know, living above a midwife who had her practice in her home and I was working with families and children. Um, so I was doing a lot of observing and watching and listening. And, um, I was looking at, you know, the, the idea of how do images spontaneously come to us? Um, 
At the time, I didn't have the language of analytical mm-hmm. psychology. I didn't know how to how to name it, even the spontaneous images from the unconscious, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I was really fascinated with that liminal space. Uh, and the pregnant woman came into my life really because I was living above this midwife and she became a metaphor in a way for the creative process. Yes. Yeah. And so I, uh, that's where I focused my work at that time. Not much had been done with the pregnant woman in terms of art therapy and in psychoanalysis. Um, the pregnant woman was left to the sidelines as it was too dangerous to work with her. Um, it it was too much of a feminine issue perhaps for all the men in the field. And so, um, it was the women psychoanalysts that took that up and changed that over time. But, um, so for me working with the pregnant woman, I was collecting drawings from her and these spontaneous patterns began to happen. I began to see those and I wasn't sure how to understand them, um, My analyst was somewhat helpful with that, but that wasn't, you know, that wasn't the work that we were doing. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, the pregnant woman became this metaphor about how to work with the unconscious, how to work with uh, spontaneous images, how to look at archetypal patterns, uh, and also how to work with complexes. Um, This is while you were studying art therapy. Yeah, I had not gone into training at this point. I was just really working with people. It, it, Leslie, there were, like James Hillman came to Leslie several times. Mm-hmm. I think the reason why I wrote this book, Laura, was that there is a lack of um, understanding for art therapists about the academic and the clinical language that gives um, analytical psychology a place. Um, there's a lot of misinter mis, um misunderstandings about Jung. Uh, and so this book really, as I was going through my work and, and working clinically, I think, oh, but that's, that's Jung. Jung said that. Jung right. talked about that, you know. Um, Jung's already been working on this. Um, so um, I, and yet that was not in, in the academic material. So that was the real driving force for me. And behind the scenes was this pregnant woman metaphor, right? You worked with that and you completed your master's degree. Mm-hmm. And then what happened? So I completed my master's degree and kept working as an art therapist okay. and continued with my analysis and my own unconscious, um, my own work with my unconscious. And, what, and let me just ask you, so why did you continue analysis? Because you, for personal reasons, or wasn't part of what was necessary for you as a clinician? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. You know, um, I think there, it was definitely for my own personal interest in the unconscious Mm -hmm. and my own um, interest in my own psychology, uh, in tracking the changes that I was going through, uh, as a, as a woman, you know, uh, making changes in my life. Um, and analysis was just an, a, like a safe emotional home for me to right. come to, you know, to be able to work with my own imagery. Um, as an artist, it was also very uh, conducive to being able to facilitate my own creative process. So, And then eventually you decided to enter a training program to become a Jungian analyst. So what happened in, in between there? Yeah, what happened in between there? Before I went into training, you mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Why did you enter training? Mm-hmm. Well, I was teaching um, art therapy classes, you know, in the graduate program. and um, You mean gosh, at Naropa? Yes, at Naropa. Uh, and I was really interested in more of the how t- how do we help students that are learning clinical material and how to sit with um, people around their material, their Mm -hmm. personal material. How do we help them become more um, present to what the unconscious is wanting, the direction of the unconscious? Because as Jung says, the the psyche has its own innate healing capacity, Mm -hmm. if we're willing to sit with it and be with it um, and work with it. Uh, 
It's not about the ego forcing some kind of healing process. Um, the ego, in fact, is often confronted with material that it really doesn't want to deal with. So it pushes it off into the shadow, right? Disavows it. Um, so I was really feeling a lack of clinical language and understanding of how how to talk about what I was seeing in my group class and in the clinical material working with students. And Jung has clinical material. I was in the study group for many years before I went into training, so I was reading Jung at the time. What, what kind of study group? A Jungian seminar, so where we were reading the collected works. This, you were just doing this on your own? Correct. With the yeah. group? Okay. Yeah, yeah, with the Denver seminar at that time. And, you know, learning, studying, reading. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you were saying how Jung really wasn't present in your coursework mm -hmm. when you were at Leslie. No. Or at Naropa. And that's interesting because I was thinking about it. So many people ask me, how did I become interested in Jung? And I always say, well, you know, it was through my analyst. But the truth is, when I was a student at the University of Washington in Seattle, I never told this story before. When I was a freshman, I got very sick. And we were on quarters instead of semesters. And I had to take uh, the spring quarter off because I was just so sick. And I went to Florida and I stayed with my grandmother. And when I got back home to Seattle, I, wa I needed to make up that quarter. And so they were offering courses during the summer. Mm -hmm. And there was a class called transpersonal psychology. <laughs> and it was a very small class. And we actually sat outside a lot in a circle. <laughs> and that's where I first became introduced to Jung um, was in transpersonal psychology class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember that professor, he talked about the difference between positive addictions and negative addictions. And he was a <laughs> runner. Mm. Um, and also that's where I learned about TM, Transcendental Meditation. And um, right after I graduated from college, I received my TM instruction. So anyway. Well, I think there are these major points in our lives where somehow what's happening in the collective around us, whatever we're engaging with, um, that we've become so familiar with, it, it loses its interests. And mm -hmm. we have to you know, we're, we're seeking, we're looking for something else. Um, and I think that's when many of us fall into, into Jungian psychology as, as being something that is nourishing and confirming of our process, um, and offers a container that is, that makes sense. You know, yeah. it, it makes sense. It sure does. Yeah. Sure does. Yeah. So you were studying Jung, you were in analysis, you were studying Jung, then you decided to enter the training program, which is not an easy thing to do. No, it's a huge it's commitment yeah. of not just time and money, but of your energy. Yes, absolutely. It's a complete devotion, really. And it's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, it really isn't. You know, it's all, all through the training. I was saying, why am I doing this? What, you know, and that was a really important question yeah, to ask, Yeah. you know, because it's like, it's not about the ego. The ego's asking that question, but the soul is saying, no, there's reasons for this. There's a pull. Um, and, and that's, that's what we surrender to is that, that process of being also in a liminal space while we're in training, which is a really hard place to be. You know, I had to give up, I had to give up my already what I had established as a professional and I had to go back into this deconstruction place, you know. And so you've mentioned liminal space a couple of times for mm -hmm. people that are not familiar. Would you talk a little bit about what that is? Sure. Um, that is, um, comes out of the anthropological uh, field and is looked at um, as stages of initiation so there's preliminal before we go into it, uh, liminal, which would be the the stage of tasks and and um, and the difficulties, the challenges, and then there's the postliminal, which is when we come out of that that difficult surrendering process uh, and we bring the gifts back into the collective, 
And Jung was very much about that. You know, he, he had stages of therapy and felt that people should take a break from therapy and go back out into the world yes. and integrate what they're doing out into the world. Um, it's not just this long term, endless process of trying to get rid of all your negative uh, whatevers, right? right. <laughs> your, your, his idea is that you're working on yourself um, and, and bringing from the unconscious the gifts um, that can be shared with the world that consciousness, that new consciousness. Mm -hmm. and, and that reminds me that one of the things that's noticeable about your book, which is beautiful, by the way, it's Thank gorgeous. You. And it is absolutely fantastic. I don't say that about every book. But this book is a, a work of art. No Thank pun intended. you. So mm -hmm. it is broken up into three parts. Um, that's right. The first part is called gateway preparing to engage. The second part is called attending, engaging with the unconscious. And then the third part is called passage, engaging with images. So mm. would you just tell us why the three parts and what they sure. mean? Sure. Well, um, you know, this is, again, based on my research with the pregnant woman um, and her stages of pregnancy before she gets pregnant was the gateway stage. She's mm -hmm. thinking about getting pregnant then she's in pregnancy, that's the attending phase, then there's the birth, and that's the passage. So if we translate that into the book and working creatively, which is how I think about the pregnant woman is a metaphor for our creative process. The book um, allows us first, I kind of introduce us to the concepts, that's the gateway into analytical psychology and mm -hmm. circumambulating around it, right? And then attending is a phase that I really like because it's more feminine. It comes from the Latin verb tenir, which means to hold and to care for. So there's this place in the middle, this liminal space or this attending time where we're, we're, we're consciously making an effort to attend to our unconscious. We're working with our dreams. We might be working on a painting or a project, um, the world is, and the outside collective world is not so important. Um, we're really kind of obsessed, you know, we're, yeah. we're, our energy is really becoming focused. And it's in that time that we have, you know, both fears, so tremendous anxiety, annihilation, um, anxiety, fears of death, because it's in that place that we're making these transformations and they're really archetypal. Um, and then uh, we're also, as an art therapist, you know, working in that phase, there's, we're producing some images or we're struggling with a painting and recognizing our complexes around that, what's getting in the way, what's keeping us from the work, what, how to get back to it. You know, it's a whole process in that attending phase. And then the passage phase is, is for the pregnant woman, it's when birth starts and she begins to labor to give birth to this baby. In the same way with the creative process, we're, you know, really bringing the final touches to this painting or this project that we have in our life. Um, we know that we can bring it, bring it out into the world. And also that's a tricky stage. It's a very um, tender stage. Yeah. Things don't always launch, you know, so we're not sure it's going to be successful. Um, so that's a whole nother process. And it's interesting that you mentioned that you met with some resistance in the beginning with your work with the image of the pregnant woman. Is that what you said? Because that's where we all came from. Yeah. I mean, each and every one of us mm -hmm. came from a pregnant woman. So that's um, right. it's a pretty big image and it applies to everybody. So you mentioned pregnancy when you talked about these three parts, but so mm -hmm. how, how would men relate to this then? Mm, I thought you might ask that question. Yeah. yeah. Well, so if we think about it as a metaphor, I think, as you said, we've mm -hmm. all had that experience. We've all been um, connected to that space. Um, and I think that is, uh, if, if, in a way, understanding the process and the, the initiation stages that the pregnant woman goes through, the, the man can work 
imaginatively with the idea of being pregnant. Um, you know, he has a connection to his own feminine, his own creative process. And that's just as relevant for him as well as for women. You know, it just recently, I think you, you posted a lecture by Marion Woodman and, you know, I just yes. can hear her say, and this means you too, men, exactly. <laughs> you know, that this is, this is about all of us. We all have access to both sides of the, of the gender spectrum. So I had shared with you before we started recording, and I, I think I'm going to share it here with everybody. When I was preparing to launch this podcast, and you use that word, that was the word I used back then, three years ago, I, you know, it, it involved a lot of preparation, I had to create a website and figure out which microphone to use and how to record and all of that. So yeah. it took many months of preparation. And I was saying that I felt like I was pregnant mm -hmm. and I was telling people around mm -hmm. me, well, the people close to me that, you know, I feel like I know I'm not pregnant, but I feel like I'm pregnant. And, um, somebody said to me, you're preparing to give birth to this podcast. And, mm. you know, obviously symbolically, not, not literally, but, but in a way, yeah, almost in a way, literally, um, yeah. because it was a creative project that took many months of gestation, right? Yes. And, and go yes. ahead, please. Well, no, I, I think that that there's a couple things that I would say to that is that, you know, Jung talked about that split between the psyche and the soma. It's, it's a false split for right. us that really you were feeling it in your body in yes. a somatic way of producing this podcast. And, um, I think in that way, men can feel the same thing. It's that creative instinct that pulls together, um, the, action and reflection instincts into a creative force. You know, it's really psychic energy can take on force. Um, you know, unlike Freud having just one instinct of the cre of the sexual instinct, mm -hmm. um, you know, Jung had, he named five instincts, the sexual instinct, but then also nurturing reflection and movement and creativity. Creativity was a major instinct for Jung. Um, and we saw that in his work. So, you know, he was really the father of art therapy and, and that's so important. Yes. And I want to talk about the red book because you do address that in your new book, but before that, I want to talk about, or just mention, uh, an article that you had published in the journal of prenatal and perinatal psychology and health back in the summer of 2012. It's called pregnancy as a feminine initiation. I will provide a link to that on this podcast page, this episode page. Um, so is that something that led you to write this book? You wrote that article. And then I know you had a chapter mm -hmm. that was included in Dr. Rubin's book called Approaches to Art Therapy. Correct. Yeah. I think um, the the article on pregnancy uh, was a way for me to consolidate the work I've been doing for so many years um, mm -hmm. from my art therapy program into um, my clinical work of really working extensively with childbearing related issues from a more art therapy Jungian oriented perspective and trying to bring analytical psychology um, into that. So and integrating those. But the chapter on art therapy uh, was more focused on bringing the language to art therapists. What's the language for art therapists? If we're thinking about Jung's model of the psyche, it's a very different model of the psyche. It's much more dynamic and um, and paradoxical. Uh, it's, it, there's a focus on the unconscious and the innate healing capacity of the psyche uh, and those spontaneous images leading the way rather than the therapist giving directives and leading the way, which sometimes is what our therapists um, are trained to do, which is to, you know, give, have a treatment plan and lay out what the drawings or the art projects will be. Jungian art therapy is more of a perspective of following the creative process and 
Jung, you know, back in 1912, he wrote the, the essay on the transcendent function, and then it was put in a drawer and wasn't published until 1956, which was around that time, and which was a real shame because, it, yeah, but it is the way it is. So, you know, but he was really uh, articulating that creative process that is so inherent in all of us, male or female. Um, and how does it work and that transcendent function becoming ignited because of those tension of the opposites, right? It brings me to the question I've been wanting to ask you. So basically, basically, what does an art therapist do? Well, very basically, an art therapist provides art materials for people to, uh, to create or express what cannot be expressed through words. So it's the uh, unworded material that can come through the images, which Jung was, you know, all about the image. Psyche is image, he said. Um, so art therapists are facilitating that unworded contact um, and basically unconscious material, right? Which is why it's so shocking sometimes when someone will make an image or draw or paint or, um, and they will surprise themselves and get maybe freaked out or disturbed by what they've made. Um, that becomes a, a really concrete image of shadow content mm -hmm. of unconscious archetypal forces, perhaps depending upon what it is. And as an art therapist, then you interpret the image with the patient they might interpret it more, um, more maybe helping to facilitate what the image needs, how to integrate aspects of it, to help the person who's made that image get to know it, to have a relationship with it. So to... now who would come to see an art therapist? Who would come to see an art therapist? Uh, well, I mean, everybody is capable of working with an art therapist. You don't have to be an artist to work with an art therapist. In fact, I think sometimes artists are much more inhibited right. needing to get it right. Yeah. So um, I think oftentimes people come to an art therapist because they have some feelings of blocked energy. Mm -hmm. and they think, oh, art therapy might be helpful for me. I can have this space to also do that. Um, or I haven't been successful in other therapies art therapy might be a way that will open up what I need to talk about. Um, sometimes it's a wonderful way to work with trauma, you know, right. Often, right? Because those are things that are unworded. You can't talk about it. Maybe they haven't been allowed to talk about it. So it's not just for children. It's for all ages. It's for anybody. It's for all of us because really, you know, that we all have access to that creative instinct. Mm -hmm. And so you work with D different art forms, not just painting or drawing, also 3D, sculpture, clay, things like that? I do. I mean, I have a range of materials in my office, and I have a board on my uh, wall where people can paint. Um, and so it really, it's an individual process. I really try and listen to the person who's sitting with me uh, and to listen to what their unconscious is needing. Uh, what they're speaking about doing. Sometimes they'll make art outside of the room and bring it in. Sometimes we'll make it there mm -hmm. in the room. Um, and definitely all different kinds of materials. I always have paper and, you know, um, oil crayons and things like that available, right, visible. And, uh, you know, sometimes people will say, it's just wonderful just to see these materials. Mm -hmm. I just like seeing the materials. They help me remember my creative inclinations. So what about things like Lego building and things with you know materials that you find in nature that you build? Is that something that's also would be considered an image, even though it's not a drawing of an image, it is a three dimensional um, piece of creation, you know, that, that yeah. someone's made? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good question because I use image somewhat loosely, right, mm -hmm. uh, to include all of that. I think it's what we bring to that image. So Jung had this word betrachen, which may um, means to make pregnant. So if someone brings a Lego sculpture they made, in fact, I have a, a patient who loves doing Lego, um, 
if she were to bring that in, we would be talking about her her relationship to it. What does she see? What's there? And that brings it alive. You know, that makes mm-hmm. symbol a living symbol by making it pregnant. So that's the act of imagination piece from Jung, that lowering of consciousness. And where did he write about that Petrachan? Oh, find goodness. That? You know, the place where I found it, I think, was in Joan Chodro's book on active imagination, which is a collection of his essays. Um, I think it was kind of a, she references it, but it's not an easily available reference. I'll get a link to that book. Yeah. So obviously because he said this, right, you know, and he was saying making pregnant, that kind of sent a spark off for me around, oh, I've been working with the pregnant woman. There's some sort of interface here between how Jung was thinking about the symbol making and working with the unconscious and my experience of working with the pregnant woman. So now does the image of the pregnant woman come up for men in that not just the pregnant woman in them, Mm -hmm. but their literal relationship with pregnant women, as far as the woman who gave birth to them, their, any woman they've impregnated. Mm -hmm. Does Mm -hmm. does it relate in that way? I tend to think very literally and concretely. Yeah, I think that that would be more concrete and literal way of thinking about it. Uh, And so as an analyst, I might be... uh, thinking about how that lives within them. Mm-hmm. So if they brought that material into the room, um, uh, I would be wondering how that feels for them inside, um, exploring what their their uh, associations are to that and what they know about it. Um, it. It definitely becomes a metaphor for some kind of process for them. As an art therapist, as a Jungian analyst as well, you would look at these pieces of these creative works symbolically. And would you say that this is the same as dream interpretation? Because I'll, I'll tell you something. And again, I don't think I've mentioned this before. I had a very difficult time recording my dreams when I was in analysis. My dreams still to this day are very overwhelming to me. They're long and they're complicated. And it's not like I dreamt of a flower and it opened. Mm -hmm. I have these really convoluted, just long, exhausting dreams. And so Mm -hmm. I didn't like that. I was upset about that. Uh, they, it was, it took too much time to write down. I would forget. I, I would get tired. <laughs> I would get distracted. I don't want to do this. Mm-hmm. So it was a struggle for me and which said something. And so we worked on that. Mm-hmm. The fact that it is a struggle for me, but one thing I did, and I think that this was more in the beginning of my analysis, I lived in a big house um, that had a big basement that was pretty much empty and it was a new house. So it was, it was pretty clean. And I taped paper up to the walls, huge sheets of white yeah. paper. Mm-hmm. I would duct tape, tape them to the walls and I would paint. Uh-huh. And they were huge and I wouldn't bring them in to my analysis. I would, I think I would take picture uh-huh. of them and bring the picture in. Or maybe sometimes I rolled them up or folded them up, but that was very helpful for me. Um, and then I, I took to sketching and, and doing it that way. And um, so many times I used to get migraines. When I have a migraine headache, mm-hmm. I would take out a big sketch pad and, and use colors and, and just kind of like get the energy out that way. And then I'd, <laughs> That's bring, right. yeah, I'd bring it in and show my analyst and we would talk about it. And yep. I got a lot out of that. Um, but she knew, you know, she knew what was going on by looking at them and Mm-hmm. Um, I just assume that that was part of Jungian analysis. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think it is. I think it's definitely not everybody uh, can work with the dreams and it is, it's heavy lifting sometimes. Some yeah. dreams are just heavy lifting, aren't they? You know, but one of Jung's contributions was re reallocating or renaming psychic energy, you know, from libidinal energy to psychic energy and, you know, it's finding how psychic energy best moves for us. So for you, it was at that point, 
painting and and using the paper uh, to express and get that out. Like you said, you know, Mm -hmm. the psychic energy took shapes, forms, lines, and could express what was going on in the unconscious. Um, And sometimes it doesn't even matter what we're putting down. It's just shifting that energy, letting it move, right? You know, letting it move that so that it doesn't get stuck. And then when it gets stuck, we get neurotic and obsessed and in a complex. Um, if we can move the energy with colors and lines and even move our body, right? Um, that's an important, important piece of analysis. So so you, you had mentioned something earlier. You said that Jung was the first art therapist. What did you mean by that? Well, he... Uh, did his own art, right? He, right. we know now, right? The yeah. red book was just, you know, art therapists could not wait for that to come out. What is going to be in this red book? Um, so it was really a momentous time when the book was published and we were able to really see all of his works that he had put into this book. Um, now, did he explain why he included paintings in this book and why, why did he bother painting? Well, I think for him, he really understood that you that that all of us need to take that psychic material and express it further. So we have we have active imaginations, we have dreams, we take the dream and put it into something else and work with active imagination. Um, Active imagination can be a process of painting and and drawing. Um, He I think he was you know, very aware of how healing that was. So his, his discovery of doing mandalas was, you know, a major, major event for him. Um, we all take that for granted now, right? You know, there's mandalas everywhere, but that was, that was really a discovery of how psychologically consolidating and healing that was to be able to work within a circle and to create an image that reflects back to us what's happening deep within our psyche. Okay, and so now I just need to interrupt you because for people yeah. who are not familiar with the term active imagination, what uh-huh. is that? Well, active imagination was a term that Jung used to work with images. Um, it's a lowering of consciousness and a, a way of sitting with a particular image. So you might choose um, one thing from a dream um, one image, like a, a purse or a, um, a flower, mm-hmm. like you said, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and sit with it and, and see if it has some kind of voice, a response back. Um, we like to kind of make demands of the images, um, but oftentimes uh, it's just better to not interrogate them, but to just sit with them and see what might come further. Um, sometimes I will say to people, um, If you were to take that image, you know, a particular place in a painting and put it on a new piece of paper, you know, and let it it grow and become more of what it is, um, that's in a way an active form of active imagination, of expanding and amplifying a color, for instance, from Mm -hmm. one painting. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you Mm -hmm. would do it talking or with sitting down with a piece of paper and a pen Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with someone in the room. Sure. Okay. I would give them materials and I would, you know, if they brought a painting in and they were really focused on one area, I might say to them, well, let's take that one area and put it on another piece of paper and see what it can become. You know, that's a making pregnant. That's an act of imagination and, and, and bringing something alive. So the, and it's allowing the image to have a life of its own. And that was what Jung was about. The objective psyche has a life of its own. Mm-hmm. And it, it has a teleological direction. If our ego is in the way too much, we miss. We miss out. You know, we stop that flow of energy. So now there are a couple things Um And these are both in part three of your book, chapters nine and 10. Chapter nine is dreams and art therapy. So Uh I want to talk a little bit about the connection between going back to what I said, I was talking about them separately. Sure. That that we would look at a piece of art the way we would look at a dream. But this chapter talks about the connection. 
and taking possibly an image from a dream. Correct. And with that. Yeah. And then chapter 10 is active imagination and art therapy. And then I'd like to talk more about Jung's Red Book and something that you mentioned that you do as a teacher, which is to have your students create their own personal Red Book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, that's right. Which is such a wonderful idea. I just, <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. So let's go back back to dreams and art therapy. Is okay. it ever the case that somebody will bring in a dream um, in, in analysis or just when you were working as an art therapist, and then you would take the image from the dream and work with that? Yes, absolutely. In an artistic absolutely. way. Well, I, you know, I use, I be careful with the word artistic because okay. that can often inhibit people. So I just will say to them in lines, shapes and colors, can you put that down on paper? What was it about that dream that sticks with you? Or what was the color in that dream? Let's see if we can find that color um, that you so love, you know? And so um, then do you use like with dreams, personal associations? So for instance, yeah. the color red has the is, is archetypal and has these mm -hmm. meanings. But do you also ask that individual? Well, what do you personally associate with the color red? Yes, absolutely. I, you know, I think that's one of the pieces of Jungian psychology that is often missed is getting those personal associations yeah. and being really precise about it. You know, um, that was Jung's word association experiment was right. about the precision in that particular psyche. Um, and that's what opens up so much, right? So if we can be patient and attend to those um, personal associations without becoming, you know, a bypassing with the archetypal, we can stay in relationship with the patient. We can stay in relationship with what the unconscious is wanting from us. And the analyst is able to hold that archetypal picture without losing the personal in the work. So, um, that's so important to get those associations. So yes. Um, and, and that opens up, you know, people's story around color, like you said, red, you know? So if somebody is talking about a dream and you, you're listening and you kind of catch on to an image mm -hmm. of, of something that they're describing about their dream, and then you'll, you're going to want them to amplify that. Yes, exactly. And to play around with it. And in the book, there's somebody who worked with the idea of um, bridges, you know, mm -hmm. and so it painted over and over different bridges. And that was a spontaneous movement from the psyche, the desire to keep working that image <clears throat> um, and the discoveries that came out of that for so, her. So that image kept coming up for her, the bridge. That's right. Yeah, and that's so you, right. You kind of unpack that with her. Uh -huh. And it led somewhere. It led somewhere. And where did it lead, right? Is right. is It's unknown. Um, and it continues to lead us. Um, but that, exactly, and that bridge had so many personal associations. It was a tremendous metaphor within the work. Uh, and then we had the image to work with, depending upon which image was the most present um, at that time. Mm -hmm. And if somebody is a photographer, which I consider photographers artists as well, yes, and yes. if their thing is they photograph bridges, would that be the same as, as a painter who's always painting bridges? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's an image. image. Yeah. And it's you said earlier that Jung said psyche is image. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I think what he was discovering was that we can see psyche through images, right? And how it is connected into yeah. the collective unconscious. Um, and that, uh, that these images are in the collective, the mandalas are cross-cultural, right? They're mm -hmm. all over the world. They come up spontaneously um, and they reflect back to us the state of our own psyche, Um they tell us a story that we may not be conscious of, uh, that our ego might not see and know. So it's a way of bringing, shining the light in the dark, right? And being able to relate to the unknown um, 
in ways there's what is that cliche phrase there's nothing more powerful than the image nothing speaks more strongly than the image something like that um i think sometimes images are more powerful than words because they tap into that collective unconscious but what if they mean something different Mm -hmm. to somebody so you if you have two different people looking at the same image they will interpret them differently Right. So that tells us about the personal, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It tells us really about what that those personal associations are. And so in a way, that's like the word association test. Um, it's like the, you know, what are our associations to those images? And then we're able to um, see different aspects of that image. You know, some people come to an image and see one thing. And I think, you know, when someone else comes with another um, that's the diversity of the image and the power and resiliency of images as well, right? Because they hold time, they hold space. Um, now, what about the shadow? Is the shadow always present in an image? Well, that's an interesting question. Is it always present? Mm -hmm. um, I suppose in a way the image making is what makes the shadow um, visible, right? It's a right. kind of a, a beginning in a beginning door into uh, the unconscious and the, the shadow content that maybe we've disavowed and we don't want. So because if somebody say is always painting bridges or always mm -hmm. photographing bridges, mm -hmm. and you say, well, what, what's, what does the bridge mean for you? Or what is your what is the bridge in you? And they say, well, it doesn't have anything to do with me. That's just a bridge. So see what I'm saying? So that's why I'm wondering, well, is it a part of us that we're not aware of? Uh-huh. So it comes from somewhere, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if they say that it doesn't have anything to do with them, um, that's kind of a, a defensive reaction because it came out of them, right? They gave birth to it. Right. And that's why yeah. I'm wondering about the shadow because mm -hmm. when I hear people say that something is not about them or doesn't have anything to do about th with them, mm -hmm. that's the first place I think of is that it, it does. It, we're just, yeah. it's, it's in the unconscious. Right. And I think that sometimes the, our conscious psyche doesn't want to know about these unknown things. I mean, it can be pretty terrifying for some people. Sure. This is not work for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of patience. It's most of the time we're moving in the dark, you know, with a flicker of light, you know, the, like the alchemist. Says, yeah. Yes. Like, the alchemist. <laughs> but like Jung said, keeping that flame protected and lit as we go through the dark, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's about all we can do. So if someone really is, says that has nothing to do with me, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get into an argument with that right, person right, about right. It. it. I'd have to respect their perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just mentioning that because I was reading a lot lately about the shadow and I mentioned it on Twitter and I promised that I would uh, keep that subject alive mm -hmm. because I believe that it is the one thing that Jung brought mm -hmm. that we can derive benefit from that is just not being dealt with enough. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very hard thing. You know, we don't yeah. want to do it. Um, we just really we resist it. Uh, and, and, and that's part of what the confrontation is, you know, so we protect ourselves from it. Uh, and then we go along in our life, right. And, and all of a sudden we're confronted with something, but. So maybe that ties into this creating a personal red book. And yeah. Jung's red book was his own personal confrontation with his unconscious. So, well, think about that. You know, yeah. he didn't, he, there were places in that red book where, you know, he didn't want to know what right. was being said, right? That's right. not true. He resisted it. Um, so there's always this tension of opposites between trying to listen to the unconscious, but also, you know, we, we, 
the unconscious is filled with archetypes that are not they're not humanized, right? And so we don't just follow their direction either. I mean, if Jung had followed, there's that great story in um, Memories, Dreams, Reflections where his unconscious said, go get your gun and shoot yourself, you know? And he knew, right? And he knew, like, wait a minute. That's not what I need to do. So there's always this tension. Um, And in the Red Book, he, he really did have a confrontation with another world, with his own unconscious content and also it became the foundation for his psychology and the way he worked with the unconscious. Yeah, and I just want to mention just in all fairness about that passage in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, what I took from that is that he then became aware that there is a, that voice in him. Uh-huh. That that is part of him, that that's there. Yeah. So he doesn't have to say okay and listen to it or he doesn't have to act it out we we don't have to act out every thought we have i think that's a really great point laura we can turn to it and say okay i Mm -hmm. hear you now shut up and sit down because i'm running the show that's right and that's not that's not something i'm gonna do (laughs) yeah Yeah, right but 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 the awareness that we have that capacity we have that voice we have that urge that that is a part of us i think is very important yeah. Yeah. And, and that's part of becoming conscious, I think. And part of what Jung showed us was that struggle of that it's okay to become become conscious of this darker material and to wrestle with it. Yeah. Uh, and that, in fact, it leads to a very deep and powerful transformation if we stick with it, you know, if we stick it's, with it. Yeah. Yeah. So his red book, I didn't mean to cut you off. I want to know that's finish because we are about at the end of our hour. So I did want you to say some more about what we learned from Jung's Red Book, uh, as far as from an Mm -hmm. art therapy standpoint, um, his work with active imagination, and then your idea of having your students create their own personal Red Book. Mm, Right. Well, I think from Jung's Red Book, we just see him having a deep engagement with his own unconscious and his own visions and coming to terms with all the aspects in his psyche, whether he liked it or not, you know, he was really forced into this process. Um, he couldn't turn away from it. He was, um, in the grips, in the grips of this, um, of this, making that was happening, this becoming that was happening. But I do Uh, want to ask, was he mm -hmm. the only one of his kind to do that, you know, to, to, to take to art? Well, you know, there isn't much evidence that other people were doing it in his way. Right. Mm -hmm. And he was really doing these intense, um, active imaginations, uh, allowing the visions, allowing the, the communication and then, uh, stepping back and um, assessing and analyzing it and bringing some meaning to it. So through that process, he really developed um, he developed his own process. Um, psychoanalysts at that time might have been painting loosely, but he was really working on on his own idea of what the psyche, the structure of the psyche, looked like for him. And it was out of out of his work in the Red Book that he came to understand the structure of the psyche, the dynamics of it, how, um, how the aspects work from the persona to the anima animus, the self, the collective unconscious, right? Mm-hmm. Which was very unique. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so then what do you do as a teacher in your class? Well, I think, you know, Jung ends his book with the word possibilities. And he, you know, there's also this place where he says, you know, don't be a Jungian, right? Um, It's very important that we experience Jungian material, Jung's work. And the way that we do that is that we have to live it. And so the Red Book allows the students to engage in their own process, not to idealize or get caught up in someone else's process and then feel inhibited, like, oh, I can never make a red book. No, actually, you can get into your own process, engage with your own unconscious, and create your own kind of book with, um, you know, I encourage them to 
to learn about the structure of the psyche through making their red book. So I might say to them, you know, pick some yoga positions and do those over and over again and see what complexes come up, see what your resistance are and create images or write and journal and, and do that active imagination process. So every book is unique to the student. Um, they come up with all sorts of different ideas about what they're doing. Uh, one student uh, used the Ten Commandments. She would learned that she was part Native American. She used the Ten Commandments for the Native Americans. And she used active imagination on the commandments and then made images in response to that. Um, just really uh, very deep personal processes begin to happen. And they're actually living Jung's work rather than living through Jung. You know? Yes, and thank you for mentioning that. What you said about the concept of being a Jungian next year. I'm planning on doing an episode just about that. Are you? <laughs> yes. And in chapter 10, uh, if anybody wants to read, there is a section called Creating a Personal Red Book, and you relate uh, somebody named Alyssa's story around uh -huh. that. Yes. So we are about out of time. If there's anything else you want to mention before we wrap up, Oh, goodness. There's always so much more with Jung, I isn't know, there? It's I just know. such a, I mean, we, whenever I'm talking about Jung or, or, or teaching, it's an endless process of trying to figure out what's most important and how much is left unattended to. So I think this has been really wonderful, Laura. Thank you. It's such a delight to talk with you. And I know that there's going to be a lot of interest in this episode. Well, thank you. And it's really, it's been fun. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again for your time today. Please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J-U-N-G dot com for more information on everything that was discussed here today. There you'll also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to listen to or to download for free. The episodes are also available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your shows. So with special thanks to Carol LaRoche, Arlene Liddell Hayes, Inger Jerby, Lydia Garcia, Bill Rain, John Farnsworth, and Lenny Foster, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Young.